right. Uh, well, if you're new here, I think it's a great week to be with us. It's an exciting time to be part of this church. Uh, but it's also the first week of a brand new series. Um, we like to take our messages and kind of group them together under a common theme. We call it a series. And today we're starting a brand new one. This one's called Greater Than One. Greater Than. Um, anyone remember in school those math problems where it was like, five and six, and then in the middle there was a blank, and it was like greater than, less than, or equal to. You know that? Yeah? Those were the best, you know? You don't have to show your work. You have a 33% chance of getting it right. Anyway, normally I would explain what the series is about, uh, but I'm not going to, and hopefully it'll make sense in a few minutes. Uh, we're just going to jump right into it. So here's my question for you, okay? Um, what, what would it take for this coming year to be better than the last in your life? Like maybe you're getting ready, you know, new school year, you just maybe got into a routine. For us in our house, we get super motivated, you know, with fresh starts. We got a nice magnetic calendar on the fridge, new planners, all that exciting stuff, new pencils. Uh, and really, we're operating, you know, while we made our, not articulate, it's like, okay, well, if we do these things, hopefully this year will be better than the last, right? Uh, so what would it take? What would it take for you? Today, today, to start out this series, what I want to do is look at an area of life that, that I'm willing to bet can almost guarantee if you were to address, improve, change, alter this area of life, I, I can almost guarantee that this coming year will be better, at least in some ways, than the last. Or if you want to look at it from uh, more of a spiritual standpoint, this area that we're looking at, we often don't look at as a spiritual area or something that contributes to the development of our faith, you know, our confidence in God. But, but this, giving some attention to this area of life can also increase our confidence in God. But it's an area that is so easy to overlook and it is so essential to our well-being. We're not gonna tell you what it is yet, all right? To get there, I wanna take a look at uh, our origin story. Like the story of where we came from. Anyone like origin stories? Like as a kid, those are always my favorite. You know, like I like the Batman episodes and movies, but if there was ever one that was like, oh, this is where he came from, you know, like he's a kid and this is why he does the thing with the bats. It's like, oh, cool. To me, that's fascinating. Why? Because it's why he is the way he is. Or Superman, you know, if you know his origin story, Krypton explodes. Sorry to ruin it for you. But that's why he's like, you know, kind of allergic or sensitive to kryptonite. It's like, oh, that's why he is what he is. Fascinating, right? Well, the human race has an origin story and at times it can be hard to believe for sure, right? But if, in case you don't know, we're talking about the creation account in Genesis, like where we came from in Genesis chapter one and two, the whole Adam and Eve situation, you know, in chapter three, when God speaks things into existence. And, and let me just say this first. Um, if for you, that's a hard thing to believe, that's understandable, right? I've definitely been there. If you've got some reservations about God speaking things into existence, you've got some reservations about God to begin with, I get that. Or the idea that God just made man out of the dust of the earth, I get that. But if you'll take those reservations, right, and just kind of put them in a little box internally and take that box, just like set it aside. We could get it later, but set it aside for now and just humor me. I think if we take a, a, like a real good, solid look at this, it can teach us something pretty, pretty insightful about why we are the way we are. And so if you don't know the story, we're told in the very first pages that everything was like formless and void, that there was chaos 
And, and God steps into the situation, whatever that looked like, I don't know, but he steps in and he brings order to this chaos. He does things in order and he makes order out of whatever was and wasn't, right? And so if you know the story, he's like, let there be light, right? Like everyone at some point in their life says that when they turn on a light switch, right? Yeah, so that's what God does, right? He's like, let there be light, poof, there's light, right? Then he, he makes like land, he makes water, he, he makes the sun, the moon, he does all these different things over the course of six days. And after each thing he does, he steps back, he looks at it, and he's like, that's good, right? It says he saw that it was good. It was like this little celebration, a little reflection. Uh, you, ever, you ever like work really hard to make a good meal? And then when you're done, you eat it, and you're like, that's good. That's how I imagine it was. It might not have been that way, but that's how I imagine it was, all right? So then he comes to this point where he's going to make the human race. And he says that we're going to be made in his image. And what that means is that we're going to feel like he feels. We're going to have emotions. We're going to be able to reason. We're going to have these traits that, that God has. And what's fascinating is that in the original language, the idea of someone being in someone else's image often carried this implication of like royalty. Like a king would have a prince in his own image. And so really, God is using language of like family and royalty, like I'm going to have children, right? And so he makes man in his own image, and then he steps back, and he's like, again, he does it again. And he sees that it's good. But not just good, like extra good. Very good. And so it's paradise. Everything's perfect. It's amazing. Man and God have this relationship. There's animals. Man has a name. His name's Adam. It means man. Not so creative, but that's the situation. And then, then God, seeing everything, recognizes something that's not good. For the first time, he sees something that could be better. That could be changed, tweaked, addressed, improved. It should be better. And we get an inside look at what he's thinking. Here's what we're told. It says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Alone. Now, some of you, if you know the story, you knew it was going to say alone before that yellow word popped up there, right? Because it's just, you've heard the story, and so it's just routine. You finish the sentence. But stop and think about this for a second, okay? This is the only thing we're told, like, the only thing we get a reason for. He doesn't say, it's not good for there to be no light. Let there be light. There's, there's a very important lesson here that's being communicated. There's something that we need to know about the human condition, about why we are the way we are, about being alone. Now, if you step back again and look at the whole situation, the man that he made is not alone. There are animals, like there's other life there. And you know who else is there? God. In fact, God and man, at this point in the story, have the most perfect, uncorrupted relationship that God and man have ever had. And still, God is like, something is missing. You know, a lot of times in church circles, we like to say, like, all you need is God. You don't need anybody but God. God is everything. He's your only source. But apparently, like, on, in the very first pages of the story, God having a perfect relationship with that person is like something is still missing. It's it's someone like the man. The the word alone there, it has this idea of being the only one in a class. The only one of its kind. He's saying the man needs someone like him that he can connect with. 
And a lot of times you hear this passage spoken about at a wedding ceremony, but really this has this idea of meaningful connection. In this origin story, what we, we can walk away with is that we were made for meaningful connection. We need this. We need deep, meaningful, authentic relationships. We need people as difficult as they may be at times. It's not good for people to be alone or to feel alone. Now, if you're here today and you're like, look, I don't really believe the Bible anyway. I'm just here to like do a favor for a friend. And so I wasn't ready to like go into Genesis. I definitely don't believe that you creation account. Fine, fine. So according to our origin story, we were made for a meaningful connection. But what's interesting, and this happens more than you'd realize, according to the most up-to-date research, human beings were made for meaningful connection. There's a study that's been going on for 70 years. I've referenced this, referenced this here before. For 70 years, there's been a study that has tracked the lives of people in all different places, all different ages, all different interests, ways of life. And what they found is that the, the key to human flourishing, to life to the full, is meaningful connection. The quality of life was directly connected to the quality of relationships. According to the origin story, we were made for meaningful connection. According to the most up-to-date science research we have, we were made for meaningful connection. There's a journal, it's called the Journal of Happiness Studies. It's an academic journal. And they did another study, because this is now being replicated in other places. And they said that relationships, meaningful relationships were the single most influential determining factor in someone's overall life satisfaction. They clarified to say it was not money, though we often live like it is. It was not health, though we often live like it is. It's not security, not attractiveness, not IQ, not career success, it's meaningful relationships. We were made for meaningful connection. The problem, the problem is for us now, the problem is that our, our culture as a whole is suffering from something that's been referred to as crowded loneliness. We are seen by many, but known by few. There are people everywhere, but yet there's still this feeling like we're alone and lacking meaningful connection. A guy named George Barna, who likes to study culture and stuff like this, 30 years ago, he said that Americans were the loneliest people in the world in the world. And some people have connected it with this idea of American individualism, you know, make yourself, you do you, right? But it's leaving us alone and disconnected and it's damaging to us. Uh, there's a, a group, it's a, a global health services company, it's called Cigna. They did a study years ago before COVID, before COVID, they did a study of over 20,000 people. And what they found is that half, about half of those people said they lacked daily meaningful interactions with other people. About half of those people said that they lacked meaningful relationships in their lives. And it's not just an American problem. In the UK, before COVID, they decided that they were going to appoint a minister of loneliness it's going to be like a place in government because it was such a huge issue, is such a huge issue over there. There are now institutions that are taking steps to try to do something about this. USC just appointed uh, a, a, per, or a head of belonging, a director of belonging for students who teaches a class on how to develop meaningful relationships because we're more connected than ever, but we are lonelier than ever. And social media has only complicated the issue because it gives this illusion of connectedness. 
Social media, I heard one person say, I thought this was brilliant. He said, social media was created to make people who are far feel near. But instead, it's made people who are near feel far. It's because we craft this image of ourselves and, and show that to the world. And then we get this counterfeit form of connection. Likes, follows, shares. But it's not the real you and you know that. And it's, it's detrimental. It creates all sorts of issues. Uh, isolation, the feeling of being alone, even though you can be in a room full of people, the feeling of being alone, the lack of relationships, it, it causes us to lose perspective in life. Like small things seem big. I mean, you know this, I don't need to tell you that. But maybe you've had an issue and it's like got you all worked up and all you do is find a friend and be like, I, I can't get over this. And they're like, really? And you're like, yeah, I guess it's not that big of a deal. <sighs> we lose perspective. It causes uh, fear of intimacy, emotional instability, even poor physical health. It affects us in ways we wouldn't realize. There was a study done uh, with 7,000 people over the course of nine years, okay? And what they found was that People who had meaningful relationships lived longer than people who didn't. But it wasn't just that. They found that smokers, drinkers, and people with poor eating habits who still had meaningful relationships lived longer than people who were way healthier, didn't smoke, didn't drink, and had better eating habits, but felt isolated. Like one, one of the people taught, writing about this study said, okay, so the conclusion we draw is that it's healthier to eat Twinkies with good friends than to eat broccoli alone. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we were made for meaningful connection, to know and be known. We need that. We need it. And so, so here's what's interesting. We have this origin story. It starts out, the first, like, the first sign of problem with the human race was loneliness, being alone. And then if you, if you don't know the story, like what the whole church believes, we believe Jesus showed up later on to, to take part in what we call like the restoration of all things, or to simplify it, like to make things right. And that has to do with us individually, but also like things as a whole. And so think about that. The original problem is loneliness. Well, Jesus leaving, getting ready to leave, he's about to die. In his final hours, Jesus gets down to pray. And we're told what he's praying about. In fact, John, who was a good friend of his, writes it down and gives it to us for gives it to us for us to read and learn from. Think about this. You're about to die. You know you got a few hours left. You're gonna pray and someone's gonna record it. What are you gonna pray for? And here, here's, here's what he says. In his prayer, Jesus says, I'll remain, it's a little clunky, but follow me here. He says, I'll remain in the world a little longer in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. Talking about his disciples, the people we call the apostles. There were 12, but then there were kind of like 11, but then there were 12 again. These are the people that were gonna lead the new church movement, what would be known as the church, okay? He's like, I'm leaving them behind and I'm coming to you, talking to God. He says, holy father, Protect them by the power of your name, by our shared identity, the name you gave me. Protect them. Why? Protect them. Why? He says, so that they may be one. One. Like, one. Okay, so that makes sense, right? You've got this new church thing that's gonna start, just a few guys that were like fishermen before and apparently they gotta run this operation and it's gonna be huge. Okay, so Jesus is like, they gotta be on the same page. They gotta be well connected and you know, know each other and yeah. Okay, but he's not done and he continues and we're actually in this part, it's kind of neat. He says, in the next part, he says, as we are one. Okay, but then in the next part after that, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, 
He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. This is like way down the road. They teach, they go out, they write this stuff down. We pick it up, read it, talk about it in church. That's us. If you believe this, he's like, I'm praying for them. What's his prayer for them? That they go to church all the time. They learn to love their Bibles, that they like have really good prayers, that they're super devout. Nope. He goes on. He says, his prayer for them is that all of them, all of us may be one. Father, he says, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now that's pretty one, right? If you know what the Trinity is, like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that, but one God, one. He's saying, I want the church, like these people that believe this stuff, I want them to be like that. Like one. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard this passage taught on the, like the topic of unity, and, and you'll hear someone up here say, the church, see, we need to be unified. We need to like get on the same page. And sure, that's true. But often on the way to unity, we miss the importance of deep, real, meaningful connection. It's a step in the process toward unity. One is this picture of knowing and being known with all your bumps and bruises and issues and struggles He's like, that's what I want, like for this group of people who's gonna come after me, this thing that we started calling the church, like for, for them, I want them to know each other and to be known deeply. And here's what will happen. He says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. Like, when they do this, it's gonna say something about who I am. It's gonna validate the stuff that I taught. And then the people around them will wanna get into it. And if you know the story, Jesus leaves. Like there's the whole death on the cross and resurrection we celebrate on Easter Sunday, but then boom, like the church kicks off. And it starts, and this group, this group of people, that explodes. And, and you know what we hear? We hear that they're living as one. As one. Depending on the version of the Bible you, that you read, you might hear like in one accord. But they're, they're living with this way of connection that people on the outside have not seen before. They eat with one another. They share with one another. They love one another. They pray with one another. They laugh. They cry. They take off their masks. They're like real with one another about their issues and their problems and their hangups and they're kind of getting it, but some aren't getting it and they're all in different places and yet they're together as one. They're known and they know one another. And you know what we find out? You should read this for yourself. It's in the second chapter of what we call the book of Acts. It says that they grew by the day. They offered people a vision of life that was so attractive that they couldn't resist it. That, that was the picture of the church. The point of this series, our hope for this series, is that we'll shake, challenge, and expand what comes to mind when you think church. When, when we think church, we think here, we think greater than one person. Church is not just a one person thing. Like this whole idea of American individualism has kind of crept into the church where like, okay, I got it. It's my faith is between me and God. I go to church. I do what I gotta do to feel like my relationship with God is right. It becomes like a singular thing that we don't share with people. And, and some of us, especially if you're just starting out, like it's totally okay to start there and even to be there in certain points. But if you stay there, if it's always a private thing, you are missing out on what this whole thing was supposed to be about. Like people who are deeply connected, real, authentic, honest, imperfect, 
broken with all their issues and problems and hangups and doubts together, struggling together, headed in the same direction. And what if, what if that's what came to mind when you thought about church? Not, not a place where you, you like enter to play a part and act a certain way because that's how we act in church. And we don't wanna say that at church because well, we're at church and we like try to fit this mold and wear this mask and act this way at church. And when we do that, what we're doing is, is like, whether we realize it or not, we're building walls around us that are preventing us from, disconnect, from connecting with people. You know, what, what's amazing to me, and I look for this often, maybe it's just because I find it fascinating. What's amazing to me is one, how like what, what we know, what we read about the way the human race has been designed in ancient things like the Genesis account and how, it, like, how perfectly it lines up with what we're learning about today with the research and resources and technology we have. What's interesting. And th- like at the same time, what I also find interesting is how Jesus' final prayer for the church, for this group of people who are gonna believe this stuff, answers the problem of our culture's biggest issue. Like what if, what if, the community, the connection, the relationships, the authenticity that the church has to offer solves the issue of loneliness that our culture is aching with. Like just, just picture a world where you saw someone struggling alone and, and the answer, the first thing that came to mind is, man, you need to go be broken with those church people because you could be broken there. That's, that's why we're so big on being real and not pretending. It's why, and you've heard me say this before, if you've been here before, it's why I started out this morning saying like, hey, if you struggle, struggle with the Genesis account, I get that because I've been there. You know why I say that? Because I've been there. And because if it's hard for you to believe that, it's hard for other people to believe. And it's, there is value in saying that, in addressing, I'm wrestling through this too. But, but, we need to be willing to, to do it together. And so when we think church, we think greater, greater, bigger than one person. It's not, not just a me thing. It's something that we wrestle through with, live in together. And so who knows you? Like who, know, who knows you knows you? Whatever you're feeling now, like, over the past week. Maybe it's excitement. Maybe, maybe you're down. Maybe you're pulled. Maybe you're tense. Who knows? Or are you, are you fighting it alone? Are you celebrating alone? Are you struggling alone? I think, I think God might look at that situation and say, like, that could be improved tweaked, fixed, it could be better if you weren't feeling alone, if you let somebody in, but you have to be willing to let them in. You know, as a kid, we are shaped by the people that are put in our lives. As adults, we are shaped by the people we let into our lives. So we have to be intentional about that. Here for us, what that looks like is as a church, we, we work to try to get people on the team or in a group. Meaning we try to give them a role or a relationship because we believe that's how people connect. Like being on the team, it's great. We love like that there are people serving and greeting and getting people parked and it's amazing and we need that. But one of the most value, valuable aspects of being on the team is getting connected with other people. Especially for guys, and I know this is true of some girls and not true of all guys, but sometimes, you know, it's not so easy to just like sit down and get to know one another, right? But if we'll like park a car together, like, hey, yeah, tell them to go in that spot over there, you know, like <laughs> we might accidentally become friends. And then you find out for real, like, you know, he also has problems in his marriage. He also feels inadequate about the way he parents. He's struggling with how to handle his finances. And you don't feel alone. 
We're getting ready to kick off groups. Like I mentioned earlier, signups are, registration opens at seven tomorrow night. And I'll tell you right now, groups for us are a logistical nightmare, like from a staff standpoint. There's so many variables, there's so many dots to connect. They're, it's hard to run, it's easier to not do them. But we do them because we think it's worth it. And so there are two forms of groups. There are discussion groups where you get together and you talk about the message. It's once a week for an hour or six or 90 minutes. You get together with the same people for about 12 weeks and you just unpack it and say, okay, how did this, how do you feel when that was said? How do you, what do you think about this? And what you find is that you start to get to know one another as you go deeper into the information and friendships form. And it doesn't work perfectly every time. You might get in a group that you don't gel with and that's why we do it in season. So you can go to a different one. But there's something so valuable that comes out of that. And then we just started something called social groups, which are groups that are not discussion-based, they're interest-based, and there's no spiritual component to it, where you get together and like we have a hiking group. They get together once a week and they go for a hike, and they just get to know each other. And sometimes meaningful conversations happen in an unplanned way. Sometimes real friendships develop that last way longer than the group. There's another group that goes out to dinner once a week. We'll have more social groups in the future, like maybe guys that play basketball or girls that play basketball or horseshoes or knitting or whatever. I know a church that does a Pinterest group. I don't know what they do, but it's around a common interest. But the point is to get people together. And so what if, what if for you, really, for this year to be better than last what if really there is a deep, direct connection to the quality of your relationships? And what if you gave some attention to that and took a step? Maybe it's joining a group or maybe it's finding some friends out of the church, right? The church is not the only place with answers. But if we neglect relationships in our lives, knowing and being known, we are neglecting something that is so important to our, our own well-being and to the growth of our faith. And so don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't, don't neglect this area of life that has the ability to affect so many other areas of life. I'm gonna ask the band to come back up here. We're just about out of time. But here's the last thing I wanna leave you with. Um, some of you know my wife and I just moved. Uh, we moved just a couple miles down the road. We're now closer to the church, but we're in a new area. We're in a new school district, and so there's a lot of change. There's a lot of adjustments. There's new buses. There's new friends. There's new parents. There's new sports. There's new programs. There's new everything, and we, it, it's a little intimidating going out into this unknown for us and for our kids on so many different levels. It can be really uncomfortable, and... There's this couple, two friends of ours, like coincidentally, worked out very nicely actually, they used to be in our group. And they heard we were moving, they're here already, and they were like, we got you. Like without really asking them, they just took our, us under their wing and they introduced us to people in the area. They explained all our questions about the school district, about sports, what to do, what not to do, what to look out for, what to give time to, and, and kind of like showed us the way. And even a few nights ago, we went to their house just to hang out and to meet some people. And at the end of the night, as everyone was leaving, they stopped us and they were like, can we just talk for five minutes? And I was like, oh no. What did I do? But they sat us down and said, hey, we just want to know how you're doing. Like, how, how is it? School's about to start. All of this is about to go into motion. How do you feel? Are you anxious? you have questions? Is there anything we could do? And my wife, Allie, who's great at articulating her emotions, answered wonderfully. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how I feel because I'm not in touch with my emotions as gracefully as she is. But, but we left there, like, feeling connected, like, thinking, like, wow, that is, that, that little, like, effort should be more common. Like, we should be better about doing that with other people. But you know what? You know what? We left there, most of all, driving home, like, with smiles on our faces, feeling, facing all of this uncertainty, feeling good. 
You know why? It's because we didn't feel alone. And so what areas of life do you feel alone? Where do you need a connection? Where do you need to let people in?